Welcome to Brainish English Stories. Once in the autumn, I was in a very bad and uncomfortable situation. In the town where I had just arrived and where I knew no one, I had no money in my pocket and no place to sleep. During the first few days, I sold every part of my clothes that I could still live without. Then, I walked to a place called Ist, where the steamships were. This place was very busy and full of life during the summer, but now it was quiet and empty because it was the last days of October. Dragging my feet along the wet sand and looking closely at it, hoping to find any kind of food, I walked alone among the empty buildings and warehouses. I thought how nice it would be to have a full meal. Today, Hunger in the mind is easier to satisfy than hunger in the body. You walk around the streets, see buildings that look nice from the outside, and you can imagine many interesting ideas about them. You might see people who are warmly and neatly dressed. They are very polite and turn away from you without wanting to see your sad situation. Well, a hungry person's mind is always more active than a well-fed person's mind. From this, you can understand something clever about being hungry. The evening was coming, the rain was falling, and the wind blew hard from the north. It whistled in the empty shops, blew against the windows of the taverns, and made the river waves splash noisily on the sandy shore. The waves had white tops and ran quickly into the distance, jumping over each other. It seemed like the river felt the winter coming and was trying to run away from the ice that the north wind might bring that night. The sky was heavy and dark. Rain kept falling, and the sad feeling in nature around me was made worse by too old, broken willow trees and a boat turned upside down that was tied to their roots. The overturned boat with its broken bottom and the old trees blown by the cold wind. Everything around me was broken, empty, and dead, and the sky was full of never-ending tears. Everything looked sad and empty. It seemed like everything was dead, leaving me alone among the living and I felt like cold death was waiting for me too. I was 18 years old then, a good time. I walked and walked along the cold, wet sand. My teeth were shaking from the cold and hunger. Suddenly, while I was looking for something to eat behind one of the empty boxes, I saw a person in wet clothes. The clothes were sticking to her shoulders. She was crouching on the ground. I stood over her and watched to see what she was doing. She was digging a hole in the sand with her hands under one of the boxes. Why are you doing that? I asked, crouching down close to her. She gave a little scream and quickly stood up. Now that she was standing and looking at me with her big, scared gray eyes, I saw that it was a girl about my age. She had a nice face, but it was spoiled by three big blue bruises. These bruises were all the same size, two under her eyes and one a little bigger on her forehead, right above her nose. It looked like someone who knew how to hurt people had given her these bruises. The girl looked at me, and slowly... The fear in her eyes went away. She shook the sand from her hands, fixed her cotton headscarf, crouched down and said, I guess you also want something to eat? Then start digging. My hands are tired. Over there, she nodded her head toward a booth. There is bread for sure, and sausages too. That booth is still open. I began to dig. After a while, she looked at me, sat down beside me, and started to help me. We worked in silence. I cannot say now if I thought about the law, morality, or ownership, 
All the things that many wise people say we should think about all the time. To be honest, I was so focused on digging under the box that I forgot about everything else. I only thought about one thing. What could be inside that box? The evening was coming. The gray, cold fog grew thicker around us. The waves sounded louder and deeper, and the rain hit the boards of the box more loudly. Somewhere, the night watchman started shaking his rattle. Does it have a bottom or not? My helper asked softly. I did not understand what she was talking about, so I stayed quiet. I mean, does the box have a bottom? If it does, we are digging for nothing. We might find only solid boards. How will we take them off? It's better to break the lock. It is a weak lock. Good ideas do not often come to women, but as you can see, sometimes they do. I have always liked good ideas and tried to use them as much as possible. I found the lock and pulled it until I broke it off. The girl quickly bent down and slid like a snake into the open box. She called to me in a low voice. You're great. Nowadays, a little praise from a woman means more to me than a lot of praise from a man, even if he is very good at talking. But back then, I did not care much about her compliment. I asked her quickly and worriedly, Is there anything inside? In a flat voice, she started to list what she found. A basket of bottles, thick furs, a sunshade, an iron pail. None of these were food. I felt my hopes disappear. But suddenly she said excitedly, Aha, uh -huh, here it is. What? Bread a loaf? It's only wet. Take it. She threw a loaf of bread to my feet and then came out herself. I had already bitten a piece off and was chewing it. Come on, give me some too. And we mustn't stay here. Where shall we go? She looked around. It was dark, wet, and windy. Look, there's an upside-down canoe over there. Let's go there. Let's go then. And off we went, eating our bread as we walked, filling our mouths with big pieces. The rain got heavier, the river roared. From somewhere, there was a long, mocking whistle. Like someone big who feared nothing was whistling at everything in the world, including the wind and us. This whistle made my heart hurt, but I kept eating, and the girl, walking on my left, did the same. What's your name? I asked her. I didn't know why. Natasha, she answered shortly, chewing loudly. I looked at her. My heart hurt. Then I looked into the mist in front of me, and it seemed like the unfriendly face of my destiny was smiling at me coldly and mysteriously. The rain kept hitting the wood of the boat, and the soft sound made me feel sad. The wind whistled as it blew into the boat through a crack where some loose pieces of wood were rattling. This sound was worrying and depressing. The waves of the river were splashing on the shore, sounding so boring and hopeless, as if they were telling a very sad and tiring story they didn't want to tell. The rain and waves sounded like a long, sad sigh, as if the earth was tired from changing from warm summer to cold, wet autumn. The wind kept blowing over the empty shore and the foaming river, singing sad songs. Under the boat, our place was very uncomfortable. It was narrow and damp, and small drops of rain came through the damaged bottom. The wind also got in. We sat in silence and shivered with cold. I remembered that I wanted to sleep. Natasha leaned against the boat and curled up into a small ball. 
She hugged her knees and rested her chin on them, staring at the river with big eyes. Her face looked very pale, and the blue bruises under her eyes made them look even bigger. She didn't move, and her stillness and silence made me scared of her. I wanted to talk to her, but I didn't know how to start. She spoke first. Life is a cursed thing, she said clearly and with deep belief. But this was not a complaint. She was too indifferent for it to be a complaint. She just thought this and said it out loud. I could not argue with her because I might contradict myself. So I stayed silent, and she kept sitting still as if she didn't notice me. Even if we died, what then? Natasha began again, quietly and thoughtfully, and still without complaining. She was thinking about her own life and decided that to escape the troubles of life, the only thing she could do was simply die. Using her own words, her clear thinking was very sad and painful to me, and I felt that if I stayed silent any longer, I would start to cry. It would be shameful to cry in front of a woman, especially since she was not crying. I decided to speak to her. Who beat you? I asked. I couldn't think of anything smarter or kinder to say. Pashka did it, she answered in a dull voice. And who is he? My lover. He was a baker. Did he beat you often? Whenever he was drunk. He beat me. Often. Then she suddenly turned to me and started talking about herself, Pashka, and their relationship. He was a baker with red mustaches and played the banjo very well. He came to see her and made her happy because he was a fun guy and wore nice clean clothes. He had a vest that cost 15 rubles and boots with fancy tops. Because of these things, she fell in love with him, and he became her creditor. When he became her creditor, he took away the money her other friends gave her for sweets. He got drunk on this money and then beat her. But that was not the worst part. He also started chasing other girls right in front of her. Now, wasn't that an insult? I am not worse than the others. Of course... That meant he was laughing at me, the scoundrel. Two days ago, I asked my boss if I could go out for a bit and want to see him. There, I found Dimka sitting beside him, both of them drunk. I said, you scoundrel, you. And he gave me a good beating. He kicked me and pulled me by the hair. But that was nothing compared to what came after. He ruined everything I had on, left me just as I am now. How could I go back to my boss like this? He ruined everything. My dress and my jacket too, it was brand new. I paid five rubles for it, and he tore my headscarf. Oh Lord, what will happen to me now? She suddenly cried in a sad and strained voice. The wind howled and got colder and stronger. My teeth started to chatter again, and she, trying to keep warm, pressed as close to me as she could. I could see the shine of her eyes through the darkness. What terrible people all you men are. I'd burn you all in an oven. I'd cut you in pieces. If one of you was dying... I'd spit in his mouth and not feel sorry at all. Mean people. You sweet talk and sweet talk. Wagging your tails like dogs. And we fools give ourselves to you. And then it's all over for us. You step all over us. Miserable loafers. She cursed us a lot. But there was no energy. No anger. No hatred in her words. Her tone did not match her words. It was calm, and her voice was very dull. Yet, all this made a stronger impression on me than the most eloquent and convincing sad books and speeches 
of which I had read many and still read to this day. This was because the pain of a dying person is much more real and strong than the most detailed and colorful descriptions of death. I felt really miserable, more from the cold than from her words. I groaned softly and ground my teeth. Almost at the same moment, I felt two little arms around me. One of them touched my neck and the other lay upon my face. At the same time, a worried, gentle, friendly voice asked, What's wrong? I was surprised to believe that someone else was asking me this and not Natasha, who had just said that all men were bad and should be destroyed. But it was her, and now she began speaking quickly, hurriedly. What's wrong with you? Are you cold? Are you freezing? Ah, why are you so quiet, like a little owl? You should have told me you were cold. Come, lie on the ground. Stretch out and I will lie next to you. How's that? Now put your arms around me, tighter. How's that? You will be warm very soon now? And then we'll lie back to back. The night will pass quickly, you'll see. I say, have you been drinking too? Got kicked out of your place, huh? It doesn't matter. She comforted me. She encouraged me. May I be thrice cursed. What a strange world this is for me. Just imagine. Here I was, thinking seriously about the fate of humanity, thinking about changing the social system, about political revolutions, reading all sorts of very smart books that even their authors might not fully understand. At this time, I was trying hard to make myself a powerful active social force. It even seemed to me that I had partly succeeded. I thought I had the right to exist, that I deserved to live my life, and that I could play a great role in history. And now a woman was warming me with her body, a poor, battered, hunted creature who had no place and no value in life, and whom I had never thought of helping until she helped me herself, and whom I really would not have known how to help even if I had thought of it. Ah, uh, I was ready to think that all this was happening to me in a dream, a bad, oppressive dream. But ugh, I couldn't think that because cold drops of rain were falling on me. The woman was pressing close to me. Her warm breath was on my face. And even though it smelled a little like vodka, it made me feel good. The wind howled and raged. The rain hit the boat. The waves splashed. And both of us, holding each other tightly, still shivered with cold. All this was only too real and I am sure that nobody ever dreamed such a bad and horrid dream as that reality. But Natasha kept talking about something, talking kindly and sympathetically, as only women can talk. Because of her voice and kind words, a little warmth began to grow inside me, and something in my heart melted because of it. Then tears poured from my eyes like a storm, washing away from my heart much that was bad, much that was stupid, much sorrow and dirt that had been there before that night. Natasha comforted me. Come on, that will do, little one. Don't be so sad. That'll do. God will give you another chance. You will be all right and stand in your proper place again. And it will be all right. And she kept kissing me. Many kisses did she give me, warm kisses, and all for nothing. Those were the first kisses from a woman that had ever been given to me, and they were the best kisses too, because all the kisses after that cost me a lot and really gave me nothing in return. Come, don't be so sad, funny one. I'll help you tomorrow if you cannot find a place. Her quiet, 
gentle whispering sounded in my ears as if it came through a dream. There we lay until dawn, and when the dawn came, we crawled out from behind the boat and went into the town. Then we said goodbye to each other and never met again, although for half a year I searched everywhere for that kind Natasha, with whom I spent the autumn night I just described, if she is already dead, and it might be better for her if she is, may she rest in peace, and if she is alive, still, I say, peace to her soul, and may she never feel bad about what happened for that would be an extra and pointless suffering if life is to be lived.